Hello, everybody. Hope that you're doing well today. We're going to have a great stream today, a discussion with Will Kinney, who's a cosmologist in New York uh, at the SUNY Buffalo. Is that correct? That's correct. That's the right place? All right. Very good. Uh, Will, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us who you are and how you got there and what you work on. Uh, I'm a cosmologist. I specialize, uh, I'm a theorist. I specialize mostly in uh, early universe physics, physics of inflation. Uh, I've also dabbled in uh, dark matter and dark energy from time to time. Uh, but sort of the main line of my work is uh, inflationary cosmology. Um, I did uh, uh, my undergraduate at Princeton University and my, I got my PhD at University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, and I kicked around for a few postdocs after that, but then I started here uh, as faculty in 2003. And I have been here ever since. Uh huh. Uh, now you're originally from Montana, is that correct? Whitefish, Montana. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm from I, the I, Western United States as well. I grew up in Utah. I was born in California, but I got out of California. Peace broke out in the world um, at the end of Vietnam, and I uh, moved to Utah and had been in Utah for ever. <laughs> It's a beautiful place. I love Utah. Uh -huh. I used to spend a lot of time out there when I was uh, living in Colorado. Yeah, it's uh, it's the second greatest state in the union after Nevada. <laughs> so, <laughs> are you contractually obligated to say that? Uh, <laughs> yes, that was part of the thing that I signed when I um, Nevada. They do do some loyalty oath stuff when you when you join the faculty on the in the state yeah. here. Um, now you. Uh, you were at Fermilab for a while, is this, cor th this correct? That was my first postdoc, right? Uh -huh. So from 96 to 98, I worked in the theoretical astrophysics group. And that was back when, say, with Josh Freeman, Rocky Kolb, Scott Dodelson, uh, Albert Stebbins, mm -hmm. all those guys were there at the time. Yeah, so they were all still there. It was a um, I was at Fermilab from 2006 to 2000. Uh, it was nine years total, but six of it was at Fermilab and three was at Northwestern. Um, okay, so I, I was wondering whether we overlapped at all or not, but I guess not. No, we were, I guess, one degree of separation away. Um, I was there. Yeah. Uh, they just made the Center for Particle Astrophysics. So at Fermilab, they, you know, for the audience, they had a bunch of different cosmology related things that were going on, but they were spread out all throughout the laboratory. The computing division was in Sloan, and then the. Um, I can't remember what the name of it was, but there was an, another group that was involved in Pierre Auger, and then there was a whole group that was doing the dark matter searches, and they were all under different directorates, and so they merged them all together in, I think, 2004 into the Center for Particle Astrophysics, um, kind of a, a dotted line part of the org chart. And I came in the s second or third year after that um, endeavor started. Uh, so I was there. Um, Rocky was still there. He was still the director for a year after I arrived. And then um, I missed all the Turner uh, portion of, of Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness in Chicagoland. He had already gone to the NSF um, at that point. Um, but Rocky was there. Scott took over for him. And then um, one of the guys on my committee replaced Scott as the director for the Center for Particle Astrophysics, Craig Hogan. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, I was there through the when late I was 2000s. There, I was still, when ahead. I was there, it was still down on the third floor uh, in Wilson Hall because mm -hmm. uh, they moved it upstairs a few years after I left, I think. Uh -huh. uh, that, uh, that group at Fermilab was really one of the original uh, particle astrophysics groups in the country, right? I mean, uh, back when that was founded, it was something that was considered a little bit fringe, and it was a lot of vision between uh, Mike and Rocky, especially, to uh, to found that group and to, and to really take particle astrophysics and turn it into uh, particle astrophysics, early universe cosmology, all of that stuff, and turn it into a real field. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that at the time that they did that originally, there was a lot of skepticism about it. Um, no more. I, it's you know, it's funny to think how far things have come because uh, I remember when I was giving the topic defense for my PhD thesis when I was suggesting you know working on things like uh, uh, early universe cosmology inflation uh, uh, some of these topics uh, that I actually received some pushback from my committee about whether or not cosmology was a mature enough field to even do a PhD in. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, but isn't, to so some extent, that's I when you want to like get I've in. Been vindicated, and yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because if you want to do stuff that's been completely vindicated, or you know, like that's been completely fleshed out and is mature, then there really aren't that many faculty positions left for people. That's right. Yeah. So the trick is finding something that's about to explode uh, before it does, which is easier said than done, right? I mean, I think it's largely a matter of luck, uh, as much as anything else. If you uh, if you hit it right, uh, but uh, I feel like I was very fortunate in that regard. So this was back when everybody was reading uh, uh, Colvin Turner's early <coughs> universe book, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, it was you know everybody was you know people of my generation were really getting fired up about the idea. Of working on some of this stuff at the time mm-hmm. but it was it was considered a bit of a risky bet uh, at the time that i started studying it. so there were other risky bets as well um that were around at the time like string theory um it had been in, a, in what mm-hmm. it's like 14th wave of improvements uh, <laughs> yes. that was i mean there was a period of time in the uh, during that period of the 90s when string theory started to decline a bit uh, because of this realization that the, the uh, there was a early on there was a hope in string theory that it would be a unique theory that you could just use self consistency essentially mathematically to derive all of the necessary properties and that the idea would be that the standard model would eventually fall out of this mm-hmm. and of course it was this was at the time when it was started to realize that the string landscape didn't have one vacuum it had head of the five hundredth uh-huh. uh, and uh, this created a lot of ennui in the field up until they started uh it was the discovery of dualities uh in the 90s where they had the all of the different flavors of string theory type 2 to b and uh heterotic and i'm trying to remember every one of them but uh, and it was realized that these were all related by dualities and that was one of the first string revolutions was there was this renaissance that happened as a result of these dualities and the realization that you had structures like brains uh, and uh, and so on, they, these higher dimensional structures in string theory that you could uh, construct mm-hmm. that really led to a revival of it in the late 90s and early 2000s. And a, a lot of that was applied to cosmological model building as well. Lots of brain world cosmology was happening. Yeah. So what was it that got you into, like why inflation? Uh, when I was an undergraduate in the 90s, and so there wasn't a whole lot that was going on. I do remember... Um, so I started undergraduate in 93, and then I took two years off to serve as a missionary for my church, and then I came back um, in the late 90s, right before the discovery of dark energy. Um, and so what was Are it in the... Are you LDS, or...? I am, yeah. <clears throat> oh, cool. So, uh, so I, um, I missed a lot of that uh, kind of mid-90s development. My instructors, my undergraduate teachers were Carol and Ostley, the, the authors of the Big Orange Astronomy book. Uh, oh, so it was cool, really, right. really a great uh, place to be. I, I, was, I just went to, you know, Podunk University, Podunk State University, north of uh, where I grew up at Weber, where they have, so Carol and Ostley, who... I've heard of it, yeah. Yeah, there's that. And then Daniel Schroeder from Peskin and Schroeder, and also from the Schroeder Thermal Physics book. He was another one of the teachers that I had. Um, it's a great department. Oh, that's fabulous. Yeah, it's really yeah. kind of a diamond in the rough department that um, I, I'm really proud of the fact that I went there um, and was fortunate enough to be able to, you know, commute in and stuff. But so that's where I was. I missed a lot of the developments in the '90s. So what was it that uh, came, I guess, came into the picture that motivated you to go into um, early universe cosmology and inflation in particular? I. At the time, it was, I mean, this was right after basically the COBE results had come out. Mm-hmm. Right? So that the cosmic microwave background and isotropy had just been first measured. Uh, and I remember, I, I think it was Mike Turner that came to Colorado and gave a, a colloquium on this. Uh, and I, I still remember his slide that just had a picture of the COBE uh, map and it just said COBE wow on it. Uh-huh. <laughs> But um, so there was a lot of interest at the time in structure formation, this idea that how, how you would take these primordial perturbations, uh, you know, what was the form of the primordial perturbations that resulted in, in cosmic structure. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the time, there were two leading candidate theories that were basically equally 
uh, sort of equal contenders for the this, and one of them was these uh, adiabatic nearly scale invariant perturbations that are caused that are the result of inflation, and the other one was uh, uh, topological defects, primarily cosmic strings, mm -hmm. which was something that Neil Turok had been working hard on, right? And these were completely different mechanisms for forming structure in the universe, and Kobe wasn't really definitive in telling the difference between the two of them. Mm -hmm. So I remember that it was so I remember being faced with kind of a crapshoot is like which one of these do you want to work on if you're going to be doing uh, early universe physics mm -hmm. uh, so I you know, I had read Colbert Turner I had in, in my undergraduate I actually did my undergrad thesis uh, on uh, primordial gravitational waves mm -hmm. um, at Princeton so I had I had worked on similar subjects uh, when I was an undergraduate as well mm -hmm. uh, so, so it was a fairly natural thing for me to uh, think about doing it when I was a graduate student as well. That's sort of what I walked into grad school most interested in. Uh -huh. But as far as inflation in particular, it was like, well, topological defects are really cool. Inflation's really cool. So it was a matter of just casting around for interesting projects to work on. And when I started really diving into some uh, different ideas, it was the inflationary ones that really worked out the best for me, uh -huh. almost as a matter of serendipity. Uh, and of course, that paid off pretty well because once uh, more CMB results came in, it became very clear that topological defects weren't, certainly weren't the dominant mechanism for structure formation. Mm -hmm. We still have no evidence for them in the universe, but uh, that inflation really was the one that won of those two. So what, resounding. what kind of signature would a topological defect leave on the CMB? Well, it's super non-Gaussian, right? Because these are these linear structures. Mm -hmm. So in particular, that you wouldn't see those acoustic peaks that you get from adiabatic fluctuations. You, that, uh, the, the generic prediction of string theories was that it would just be sort of one big undifferentiated bump mm -hmm. in, uh, in uh, multiple space, right? So instead of seeing all those nice bumps and wiggles that you see in the CMB, uh, topological defects would have produ produced a smoother spectrum than one that was highly non-Gaussian. Uh, so completely different predictions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, we now know that the adiabatic uh, perturbations and the acoustic oscillations that we see in the CMB are uh, those are the ones that inflation predicted from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Now, what um, one of the things when I was at Fermi Lab that was because Albert Stebbins was there and he had done some early work on what are signatures that you would get in the CMB from primordial um, gravitational wave or gravitational radiation mm -hmm. with uh, what has the how has inflation as a discipline developed over the last say 20 years what's new in the field what's what's the same um it's changed a lot right i mean i think the data has really shifted it um because in particular, that the space of models available uh, to inflation has gotten shrunk down tremendously from where it was 20 years ago or 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. So with just the Kobe data, you couldn't really even tell the difference between inflation and cosmic strings. And it wasn't until probably about 98 that the first acoustic peak was first resolved. Mm -hmm. um, got it? Yeah. All right. So this was sort of the state of the art in the late 90s. This is, I mean, two things happened, two important things happened in 1998. I mean, the very famous one, the, the one the Nobel Prize is the discovery of dark energy accelerating expansion of the universe. Less uh, so was, this is a figure that uh, uh, Max Tegmark produced. He had been in the business of just basically, there were all these uh, cosmic microwave background measurements at the time that were gradually re refining the multipole spectrum. And he kept a, an up-to-date uh, cat, uh, tally of these things. And let me actually bring up some annotation here. Good. And what you see here is that the uh, sort of the whole picture of uh, acoustic oscillations and dark matter halos and adiabatic perturbations predicted that you should see a big peak in the microwave power spectrum for a flat universe around a multipole of about 200. And so this is multipole on the horizontal axis down here. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, CMB autocorrelation power spectrum on the vertical. And so here you have And so the multipole measurement. This is saying that uh, the smaller the multipole number, the larger the angle that you're talking about on the sky, like where the bright spots and dark spots That's are correct. in the sky. And so as the multipole right. number gets larger, the angle is getting smaller as what one over L probably. 
So you're averaging over patches on the sky, averaging over big patches is here on the left. For example, Kobe had very low resolution, so it was only seeing blobs, on, large blobs on the sky. Uh, and then higher and higher resolution, smaller and smaller patches on the sky, you get, go to the right here. So the higher multipole moments are smaller angular scales. Mm -hmm. And a multipole of around 200 is an angle of about a patches about the size of a degree on the sky or so. And whoops, I think I lost my screen share here. What went wrong? Now I, I, there we go. Am I still sharing that, or do I need to uh, do it? Go ahead and do it again. I think you need to do it again. Okay. Okay, hang on. Share screen. Let's do that again. Sorry, I think I killed the window. <laughs> um, there. And so this right about this time was when the first acoustic peak started to come out of the noise. Mm -hmm. That is, you had the Saskatoon measurement uh which uh, was a balloon measurement if i remember correctly was seeing the top of that acoustic peak and but uh, and then it was other measurements particularly the ring cat uh measurements that uh showed that drop off after the first acoustic peak so you saw the peak, the peak around l200 and then you saw that drop off going down so this was the point at which you really first started to see evidence that you, that you were seeing uh uh, adiabatic acoustic modes, mm -hmm. the cosmic microwave background. Basically, what's going on here physically is dark matter starts collapsing in the early universe as soon as matter comes. Dark matter comes to dominate over radiation, which happens about sixty thousand years after the Big Bang. The dark matter halos start to collapse. The baryons, the regular atomic matter, the hydrogen and helium in the universe, doesn't collapse into the dark matter halos because of photon pressure. The gas is still so hot that it is ionized. And because of that, you have a bunch of charged particles and photons and thermal equilibrium. So they can't fall into the dark matter halos. When they do, the pressure comes, the photon pressure pushes them back out again, and it sets up. So the collapse of the dark matter halo actually releases sound waves in the baryon plasma. And what you're seeing in this acoustic peak is, is the signature of what the, the first signature of these sound waves in the primordial plasma that indicate that this is uh, basically your, how structure is forming in the universe. Of course, here's the Planck data now. So this is the not quite the latest release. This was the 2015 release of the Planck data. Now that first acoustic peak is incredibly well resolved. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All these harmonics of these sound waves in the early universe inside the horizon. Mm -hmm. This is the point at which. So this is the point at which you started to really believe that uh, the inflationary picture was the correct one, as opposed to cosmic strings. Right? Mm -hmm. You didn't really believe it until a little bit later when you started to see the second acoustic peak come out, which was with the uh, um, uh, boomerang measurement a mm -hmm. few years later in the early 2000s. So we have gone. I mean, in the space of in, in the length of time that I've been doing this, we've gone from very vague idea of what was actually going on to just like absolute high precision cosmology. The transformation has been uh, enormous in terms of what we can say and what we can't say about what was happening in the early universe. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've learned is that in you know inflation as a basic idea gets the data that we see in the universe just bang on. Uh, it's an incredibly good fit mm -hmm. uh, and it's a huge success. For so with um, one of the results that was a big deal at the last part of my time at Fermilab was um, when there was, well, the claim was that there was new experimental evidence for inflation directly, uh, looking at the B modes of the CMB. And oh, that was that was the bicep two. That was twenty fourteen, right? Yeah. Uh, are you talking about the bicep result? Yeah. Uh -huh. And so, what um, what was that looking for, and what was I guess the end of the story, or what eventually happened in that situation, or with that result? Okay, so cosmic microwave background polarization comes in two forms, uh, and I can probably bring up a figure that shows this as well. So polarization is, uh, so you're looking at the polarization of light coming to you from the, the cosmic microwave background on the sky, right? So you see the sky as basically a big sphere of glowing microwaves. And we're sitting in the middle of that sphere and looking at the light coming to us. And the polarization of that light 
can take two forms. The first one is called an E-mode, which is basically an even parity mode. It's, it's symmetric under mirror images. And so, for example, it can take the form of these the, this radial polarization or the circular polarization, for, or this, it's not really circular polarization, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the polarization lines around hot spots and cold spots in the CMB. These E-modes are produced by uh, hot and cold spots in the cosmic microwave background. On the other hand, you can also have polarization that has a helicity like this, where it actually has a, a it's like a corkscrew, so it has a handedness and it's, it's anti-symmetric under mirror images. Density perturbations, hot and cold spots in the cosmic microwave background do not themselves produce B modes. B modes, uh, uh, because of the helicity, there's no inherent helicity in the, uh, uh, in the temperature anisotropy of the CMB, so it doesn't produce these B modes. And this is what the BICEP experiment was looking for, was these helical polarization structures. Now, these things can be created by several processes. Uh, the, fundamentally, they are produced by primordial gravitational waves in the early universe. So primordial gravitational waves produce both E and B modes, but uh, density perturbations produce only E modes. So the idea here is that this helical polarization structure is uh, a smoking gun signal for the presence of primordial gravitational waves in the universe. It gets a little bit more complicated, however, because structure between us and the surface of last scattering, where the, photon, the, the cosmic microwave background was emitted, um, which was, so the light from the cosmic microwave background has been traveling to us since the universe was about 380,000 years old. So it's, a, it, it's extremely far away. There's a lot of structure in between us and the sources of the CMB. And that structure in between us and the CMB can take E-mode polarization and turn it into B-mode polarization. One way this can happen is through gravitational lensing so that you can have galaxies and clusters of galaxies and whatnot that are sitting in the universe along our line of sight to the cosmic microwave background. And those things can actually, the, le the gravitational lensing for those things can produce a B-mode signal. And that's calculable. You can figure out from the density perturbations what that will look like. Um, and so in principle, the, at least the lensing signal, you can subtract out because you can figure out, you can predict what it ought to be and then subtract it out of your, uh, uh, your signal. The harder thing to subtract out is galactic dust, uh, in particular, um, dust inside our own galaxy will also emit helical polarized microwaves, mm -hmm. and those form a <laughs> foreground signal to these, B -mode, these primordial B modes of the CMB. So the story being that BICEP, when they looked at the, uh, this was in 2014, when they actually uh, announced a great fanfare that they had uh, detected these primordial B modes, which were signatures of gravitational waves. And not only did they announce that, but it was, it was a huge whopping signal, right? They were saying that 20% of the, CM, the anisotropy in the CMB was due to gravitational radiation, mm -hmm. right? A, a huge fraction. Uh, and it was actually something I remember hearing rumors about it before the data came out where they, they, I heard a rumor that it, it was a, a tensor fraction of 0.2 to them and 20% of the CMB is in gravitational waves mm -hmm. and thinking that can't be right. They must mean 0.02 because 0.2 is already outside of the upper bound from uh, uh, the other CMB measurements in particular clock, right? And it turns out that they really meant 0.2. Uh -huh. um, so... Uh, I remember seeing was, videos of people uh, like showing up at someone's house with some champagne, like, hey, we found it. That was Andre Linde, right? Uh -huh. uh, so I wonder if that's still on, the, on YouTube. That, uh -huh. <laughs> I hope not. It didn't age, <laughs> didn't age very well. Down. Didn't age well at all, right. And so everybody was, uh, uh, and it was funny because the day after the announcement, I had been scheduled for a couple of months to give a colloquium at Perimeter Institute. Uh, and it turns out that my colloquium was the day after the BICEP announcement, just by complete, I had been scheduled long before anybody knew that there was an announcement coming. Mm -hmm. So I had to go back that evening and completely rewrite my talk based on this new data. Uh, and of course, now that talk is, uh, it, you can actually get that talk online and it's, uh, everything in it is wrong because of course we now know that this was actually dust foregrounds and it wasn't primordial at all. Mm -hmm. That what had happened was they had severely underestimated the dust contribution uh, to their signal. 
And as a result, what it was was that they were just detecting galactic dust and misinterpreting it. Mm -hmm. A similar thing as, had happened. Uh, primordial signal. So most of my research is in exoplanets, um, and a similar thing had happened in exoplanets with some of the first detection of water on an exoplanet, and. Uh, okay. There was a reanalysis that was done, and it turned out to be water from our atmosphere that hadn't been um, correctly dealt with in the um, in removing that systematic effect from what was observed. <clears throat> so foregrounds are, are a killer, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, so one of the things. Uh, I was involved in a set of experiments at Fermilab at the time that the BICEP result came out um, showing these B modes, and it was uh, everyone, the thinking person's dark matter. And there you go. <laughs> wow, you actually found that, that actual soap product. Yeah, so you can still get it in Mexico. Um, yeah. it's, 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 I think Paul Mollive oh, owns, cool. Paul, Paul Mollif owns it. So I went to a dark matter conference in 2010 and bought like a half a dozen of these and passed them around to all the people that I was working with. That's Right, yeah. So I, I presumably your audience knows that, that the, the particle is actually named after the soap, right? Right, and not vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, so the axion, of course, is the, as, um, I, I, I can't remember who it was that said it, I'll blame it on Rocky, um, that Rocky said is the thinking person's dark matter. Um, <laughs> and, <clears throat> uh, so we had been doing a number of experiments because in the early 2000s there was the gamma, or not the gamma, it was uh, PV loss. It was this Italian experiment looking for weird electromagnetic effects in the vacuum. Um, and they showed a signal for some kind of scalar particle um, with a given mass. And it just so happened that it was in, so with, form, like with previous Axion searches, uh, they did the light shining through wall experiment where you have a beam of photons coming in, they convert into axions, they pass through some kind of barrier, and then on the other side of and the they barrier they reconvert. The photons again, right? Yeah, and so that was done at uh, Brookhaven, it was B BFRT, Brookhaven, Fermilab, Rochester, Prieste, I think. Anyway, so it was an experiment to do that. And their magnets happened to be the perfect length to miss this signal if it had been real. So they needed a. It's an oh, it's an oscillation it's an oscillation signature, and so there's always going to be some lengths where um, you just happen to be insensitive to that mass. It'll, it'll null out, right? And it was yeah. exactly in this window where they wouldn't have been able to detect it had it been there. And so uh, the, there was this Italian experiment that saw a signature that looked like it might be due to an axion-like particle, and so. A whole bunch of like a half a dozen experiments around the world sprung up all of a sudden to look for it and I was involved in the one at Fermilab and after that you know we published our results I did uh, I led a short experiment on chameleon dark energy and then after that it's like okay what are we gonna do with ourselves we have all this expertise expertise uh, that we've developed over Amanda a few years and, uh, and uh, Amal Upadi was on it and um, Aaron Cho was had and William Wester was kind of the five of us on that dark matter experiment. I mean, there were others, definitely, but um, we were the five who, I guess, kind of led the charge of, we should do this experiment, here's what the motivations are, here's what um, how it would work. Anyway, so I uh, did that experiment, and then we were like, what are we going to do with ourselves now that we're that, that one's done? And so we started designing other axion searches, and one of the ones that I was looking at is looking for really low-mass axions. So uh, axions are low-mass, really, really low-mass by the standards of particle physics. Um, and the typical searches for dark matter axions were in the micro-EV mass range. And that's right. where you get the right primordial abundances from early cosmology. And then after, um, in order to have an axion that has a smaller mass than that, you have to deal with uh, when does the axion come into existence relative to inflation. And, um, and so I was like, well, okay, we can have a situation where the misalignment angle is really small and therefore you get this really small axion mass. 
And so I started designing this experiment looking for, you know, three meter sized magnetic fields that we could use to, um, to constrain things that were less than a micro EV in mass. And we, it looked pretty promising. And then right as we were getting the design put together in order to present it to everybody, then the bicep result came out and it excluded that, um, that window in axion space of having the really low mass axions. And uh, oh. so I had to put that, I put it aside and we went with higher mass axions um, as, okay, we're gonna, that one's out off the table now, let's look at these other ones. And then what, like three weeks later, or a month later, um, by then the ship had sailed and uh, when the results were retracted, we were kind of too far along on what we were, what we had pivoted to. Uh. <laughs> Well, it took about a year, maybe a little more. Yeah, I guess that's true. Really fully, yeah, because uh, they really needed the updated. Because uh, what had happened there was that Planck had not actually released their dust maps publicly, right? So they had uh, they had just sort of made a good guess at that. And when Planck finally released his dust maps, and they went back and, and worked with the bicep team and came up with those combined dust map results that were really the ones that killed it mm -hmm. finally. I mean, everybody was very suspicious of it uh, much earlier than that. Because it was so big? And I remember it. Right. Yeah, and like, well, and Dave Spurgle and a couple other people were talking about foregrounds uh, fairly quickly after that. They were, I, I, as I remember rightly, especially some of the Princeton guys were quite skeptical of the result pretty early on, correctly so, as it turned out. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, I, I admit, that was one ambulance I chased so hard I ended up with, like, uh, you know, uh, ended up losing chipping a couple teeth on the bumper right uh -huh. I, I, I bought into that one uh -huh. <laughs> well so i was i was disappointed um but you know that's the way things go um with the would have been you know if that had been true it would have been a bonanza right because that kind of a huge amplitude for gravitational wave modes you're talking about being able to test inflationary consistency condition you're, you're i mean all of this stuff you'd know the energy scale of inflation you'd be able to tell whether it was single field or multi-field you'd be able to do I, I i was looking at that result and thinking you know i got more papers than i know what to do with to write for the rest of my career uh -huh. this one result right it would have been great if it were true but life is harder than that uh -huh. uh, and uh so it seems like um, to me, so it seems like we're kind of at a juncture where we need to figure out what we're doing. Like cosmologists, I say we, I mean like cosmologists and high, and high energy physicists, um, there isn't a whole lot of uh, new signal to find or there hasn't been any really new signals to, to find. <sighs> Victims of our own success in a lot of ways in mm -hmm. both fields, right? Uh, so the, the standard model has turned out to be just like bloody perfect all the way down to you just have a nice uh, double of mm -hmm. eggs, you know, nothing funny going on there. And uh, 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 the, it's just there's no there's no chinks in it, except maybe what is it? Uh, left on flavor universality seems to be showing some weirdness, mm -hmm. right? That's so why don't, only place why don't we take a look at that? What are some of the, okay, so when the Higgs discovery came out, it was a perfect discovery for someone at the end of their career. It was a terrible discovery for someone at the beginning right. of their career because there's nothing new. It's like, okay, we found the Higgs. It was exactly the way that we thought it was. We'd ruled out everything else that was possibly available through the Tevatron. The only place, the Higgs happened to land where the Tevatron was least sensitive. Um, and right. so there was, there was nothing else to see here. And the same kind of thing happened, I mean, like with the dark matter, there's still no dark matter um, signal coming from anything. And despite uh, the multiple announcements in the mid 2000s of, okay, this time we really found it for sure. Um, between the Dama and Libra collaboration, and then there was a, a hint of a signal from CDMS. Um, and the neutrino right. physics. And none of those have turned out. Yeah, none of them worked out. The neutrino physics, um, the LSD result from the late 1990s kind of disappeared, and uh, Mini Boon and Micro Boon still haven't seen any anything new from it. Uh, I guess when I look at all of the particle physics results from the last 20 years, the only one that still, that appears to be mysterious is the uh, G minus two, the muon G minus two experiment. Um, 
and we're running out of space to look uh, before we start running into like the hard boundaries. Like eventually, dark matter experiments are going to be so big that they're going to be swamped by other backgrounds besides a potential dark matter signature. So, what um, what's your take on the state of like particle astrophysics or particle cosmology, and where where does it look promising on the experimental side or the observational side to go? Well, I mean, I, yeah, one of the problems, the, the LCDM cosmology is a lot like the standard model in the sense that, it, that most of the tests of it have come out just like, so in the cosmic microwave background, there's all kinds of things that could have happened. You could have seen features in the power spectrum. You could have seen non-Gaussianity. You could have seen isocurvature modes, all of these things that would indicate some sort of exotic early universe physics that a lot of people were betting on, right? I, I think there was a time when most inflationary theorists would have told you that non-Gaussianity was almost a sure bet in Planck, mm -hmm. that it was probably going to be seen. And of course, Planck just put a very strong upper bound on it and killed off whole fields of models mm -hmm. are, are gone now because uh, uh, they, they violate the, they, they're, they exceed the plant bound. But um, the one place where things don't fit right now is the, the Hubble constant, mm -hmm. the, the not discrepancy, right? So we haven't found dark matter. We haven't found any weird things, the, the, the cosmic microwave background, right? So the, the Planck satellite has measured the cosmic microwave background to cosmic variance uncertainty out to an L of like 2,500, mm -hmm. right? That means that the er the errors due to the instrument sensitivity are subdominant to the intrinsic error from just only having one universe to look at. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Over the entire width of the sensitivity of the experiment, it's like Planck was perfect. There's no need to ever redo it because even there's nothing else to learn. Right. The systematic error bars are bigger than yeah. you could ever. Yeah. Uh, and the only way to kill the systematics is to look is to go to a different horizon volume and look over there. And we can't do that. So uh -huh. we're screwed. Right. We're, we're limited by the fact that we can only look at one universe. So that's not true of the polarization. There's still work to be done there, mm -hmm. right? But the temperature anisotropy is basically done, uh, at least in a primordial sense, by Planck. And that didn't show anything new or unusual. It was a lot like the Higgs. It was just the blankest, the simplest possible model worked for everything. You can fit the Planck data with a six-parameter model very nicely, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we haven't seen dark matter. And certainly, I think the case for wimp dark matter has been eroded significantly. Mm -hmm. right? uh, that yeah, well, most of its discovery space wimps was yeah. M most of its discovery uh, space was the stuff is, that was you know kind of in the designs over the last probably ten years. Um, and yeah. then they build these well, big and detectors. I, remember, and... I was at Columbia when. Uh, uh, Elena April and some of these uh, uh, scientists that were uh, first putting together the Xenon experiment were doing their first proposals. And I went to a bunch of the talks on this. Uh, and they were looking at like the Xenon one ton thing is they were designing it for precision measurements, just sort of like almost under the assumption that they would have seen dark matter by then. They would mm -hmm. have had it. They were, I think there was, a, there, there was a lot of confidence that there was going to be a detection. And they were already thinking about things like directionality and, and, uh, and, and high precision ways that you could learn more about the properties of this particle once you had detected it. And of course, they're still just making bigger and bigger vats of xenon mm -hmm. just for the, the signal itself, and it hasn't showed up. Yeah, well, I remember um, at, the, some... at the same time, because you mentioned you know, that people thought that they were going to find it. I was at a conference at Fermilab uh, in 2008, maybe where people were wagering, are we going to detect dark matter in five years or 10 years, was kind of the question at hand. Right. And so, <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, the confidence, yes. <laughs> so that, it was an interesting, um, it, it was certainly an exciting time to be alive because, you know, CDMS had basically, I guess, gotten the funding to ramp their se themselves up. And then the liquid argon detectors were, you know, there were still people that were turning you know, a shoebox and a microwave oven into a dark matter detector. Um, and then it was slowly going into the process of whittling it down to what are the what are the detectors that can scale up to the to the one ton. Uh, but that was still, you know, right. a half a decade off before you got there. So you were still able to do your you know, this was when um, 
the CCD, they took the Sloan CCDs. So there, there are a bunch of CCDs that were made for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Oh wait, no, it was a Dark Energy Survey, sorry. It was, they took the CCD chips for the Dark Energy Survey that weren't science quality and they said, well, let's just make it into a dark matter detector for something. And so they just had the, a few CCDs in a box and they put it in the in a cave underground at Fermilab and did their dark matter measurement. And it was the world's best, right? This is something you could do on a shoestring budget yeah. because <laughs> it was still the Wild West. Um, and so it was a really exciting time to be alive, uh, but it hasn't panned out. Uh, in any of these things other than you know it's it's always yeah, I mean, great when you achieve your design sensitivity but it certainly helps if you see something the wimp miracle this idea that if you just put in the weak cross section and you get out the right abundance for dark matter more or less is completely dead now right i mean the cross sections are already bounded to be way below what would give you so now you have to have these more complex models and so it's not nearly as appealing as it once so there's no tuning supersymmetry tuning that you can do to um, I, I never understood. I was under the impression that supersymmetry had almost an infinite number of knobs that they could turn, and therefore it was kind of hard to place well, constraints yeah, on it. That's what I mean. <laughs> but, so the the basic calculation that we all learned, or uh, back in the day in, in our cosmology classes, where if you just have something that has thermal freeze out, the relic abundance depends only on the cross section. And when you plug in the cross, you pr plug in the relic abundance, the cross section you get is the weak cross section. Mm -hmm. Right. This is one of the big motives to look for wind. Is it's just like it's this simple thing that the only thing that determines the, the late universe abundance of the dark matter is the, the is the uh, cross section mm -hmm. of the particle, and it turn, and the weak cross section gives you a, a, a omega whole dark matter of order unity, and uh, so everybody's like, well, then that's too big a coincidence to be you know accidental, right? Uh, so it turned out it was wrong. But. Yeah, one of the things that um, had come up. And I, I saw that Sabine brought this up in one of her videos, was talking about how like we should revisit Mond uh, as a potential explanation for uh, dark matter. Mond meaning, so you modify the equations of motion from gravitational interaction, and that will explain the galaxy rotation curves, and uh, then it, it was initially it wasn't a relativistic uh, formulation, and so Bekenstein improved it and made it so that it was, I guess, covariant, and therefore was consistent with relativity. And uh, some of the evidence that was well that she brought forward were like the bullet cluster, where you have these two galaxy clusters that have passed through each other, and the mass signature is separate from the gas. Like that's a way where the gas, because it gets right. The, the two galaxy clusters collide, the gas stays put in the middle um, because the gas can interact with itself and the dark matter um, is able to go through. Uh, I didn't really buy her explanation there. I've always had a hard time with MOND because uh, I worked, before I went to Fermilab, I did torsion pendulum experiments. And uh, I was... Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, that stuff is crazy. So I was in, uh, I was not in the... You mean measuring big G? Uh, so I did um, inverse square law was the experiment I was on. It was not the famous group from the University of Washington. There were actually two torsion pendulum groups at the University of Washington. And I was in the... They the, had one at University of Colorado, too. I, I, I mm -hmm. knew some guys who worked in that lab. Yeah, yeah so I was in the, the lesser prominent of the two groups at the University of Washington. And one of the things I was told is, see if you can come up with a... You know, could we detect MOND in the laboratory? Because the accelerations that they're talking about are the accelerations right at the level where you're oh. sensitive on these with these torsion pendulum experiments. And I started asking around to different theorists, and now he's got the thing like, oh, it doesn't work because the accelerations are too big. Like the acceleration is exactly what you're saying it should be. Why is it? And so I, no matter whenever whenever I bring it up, I guess I've never been in the same room with someone who was sufficiently well versed in Mond itself or in Tevis or whatever the current iteration is to be able to say here is specifically why you wouldn't be able to detect this with a torsion pendulum. Um, Presumably if your background <laughs> field is strong or something I don't know I, I that's I, 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear somebody answer that question. I, I, I have no idea. Uh -huh. And I guess part of me also, I, I suppose, has a little bit of a, a chip on my shoulder on behalf of my colleagues because I, I was only in that for about a year and a half. Um, but it seems like there are many instances where the torsion pendulum results are kind of ignored because it's not convenient. Uh, I, another example that came up in the mid 2000s was the um, does antimatter fall gravitationally the same as regular matter? And you can place constraints on that by looking at the matter antimatter composition of the blue, gluon field in these uh, weak equivalence principle measurements. And then you can show, like, to 11 decimal places or something like that, that they fall at the same rate. Right. So this is just different materials falling at the same rate. Uh -huh. different, different elements. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Right. So you're right. So the torsion pendulum experiments are, um, I think that. And still in my mind, that seems like a plausible test of modified Newtonian dynamics is to look at the torsion pendulum experiments. Um, you would think. I don't know. I, I, I'm not real bullish on Mon. Mm -hmm. I, I, it just, there are, you have to have too many, too many miracles before breakfast in order for it to all hold together. Uh -huh. uh, and I, it, to me, it doesn't, it doesn't really pass the smell test of being a, a, something that I feel is likely or be mm -hmm. enthusiastic about. I, a lot of the modern MON models, right, especially like the ones that I know that, that Sabine is very big on, mm -hmm. these Bose-Einstein condensate things. Yeah, now someone pointed out really that it's actually, kind of a, she, she proposes for modified gravity as opposed to MON. I guess MON is one class of modified gravity. Right. Right. But these things would basically be these, I mean, they're almost like a dark matter. They're, they're modified gravity versus a dark matter theory is almost sometimes a matter of definition, right? Because you have the Einstein field equation, you have the left hand side and the right hand side. Mm -hmm. So if I modify the left hand, if I add an extra turn to the left hand side, that's modified gravity. But mm -hmm. if I take that term and I move it over to the right hand side, then it acts like a stress energy component and then it's sort of a dark matter theory, right? So okay. I've always been a little unclear on how you distinguish those. Once you start getting down to that, because in most modified gravity papers, right, they'll write down some sort of Jordan frame Lagrangian with the modified gravity theory and they will immediately transform to the Einstein frame where it acts just like GR plus a bunch of extra source terms, uh -huh. right? And so then, in what way is that not just a more complicated dark matter theory or adding another stress energy component? It's it's almost a it's almost a moot point mm -hmm. switch. Uh, and I think some of these modified gravity theories that end up, that then end up looking in the Einstein frame like a Bose-Einstein condensate, where you have this big long wavelength thing that envelops the size of a galaxy. Mm -hmm. right? So structure formation still takes place in the usual way. Right, mm -hmm. uh, and, but uh, at galactic scales, it's different because of the fact that you have this coherent state mm -hmm. uh, of this stuff. Uh, that, uh, it, at least as I understand it, that's one of the, the things that, that she's advocated for mm -hmm. quite a lot, and that's that's certainly a possibility, right? I mean, the idea that you could have dark matter being some sort of well, this happens in, in extremely light axion models too, where you have you can have a condensate where the you know, basically the, the wavelength of the, the coherence length of the condensate is galactic scales, mm -hmm. right? And you can get flat rotation curves and all this stuff, and, uh, but it behaves on galactic scales a lot, a lot differently from dark matter so that you can get things like Tully Fisher out of it for free and uh, uh, that, that sort of stuff, right? mm -hmm. all the things that are the selling points for MOD. Yeah, my, um, um, my money is still on axions as the dark matter, partly because I don't really have skin in the game anymore because I'm looking for planets, but um, the I thought there was a lot of stuff still to do. One of the concerns I had when I was doing axion experiments is that they were so like the ADMX experiment was looking for dark matter axions um, and very slowly scanning yeah, the very, very slowly. <laughs> you have a super high Q oscillate, you know, uh, resonant cavity. And then you have to, you can only scan the width of that resonance peak as you move over the, the, one of the issues that I, well, that I was concerned about is that they were relying on computational estimates of what the ambient axion density would be. And so, uh, when they place these limits about what the cross section is, it's conceivable, and it depends on the distribution, right? And so yeah. you run into the problem with um, if you have if the axion dark matter clumps on really small scales, then the chances of the Earth actually passing through 
a region where there's some abundance of dark matter is pretty small. Um, so if it does form a condensate that actually is coherent over a long distance scale, then that actually fixes that issue. But at the time, yeah. the estimate was that axions would coalesce down to earth mass uh, mini halos or micro halos or whatever they called them. Um, and those would be not even quite solar system size. Uh, and so you have a solar system size thing, but there are many, many solar systems that you can fit between us and the nearest star. And so the idea that the earth would magically pass through it over the 90 seconds that you're observing at the right wavelength is, um, was pretty small. Um, so I, that was always kind of a, a caveat that was implicit in the exclusion plots. Uh, but right. You know, what do you do? About I, I worked with, I worked with Pierre Sakivi quite a lot a mm -hmm. number of years ago. Uh, and uh, so he was actually at the time trying to argue that uh, axions should actually give you an inverted annual modulation re relative to what you would see with uh, uh, WIMPs. Uh, because so, of the, you know, the, the, the formation of these caustic structures that he has advocated for. Yeah, so I remember I visited Florida um, in the mid 2000s where he had just published a paper on here's what you would see in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey from uh, caustic lensing of, uh, you know, if you have, because the dark matter with axions is really cold, you get really thin sheets in phase space, and so you can have, you know, a, and then you when get, those fold over on top of each other, you get caustic formation. Right? Yeah, and, and then that would cause a gravitational lensing signature because you have all the mass concentrated in a certain part of the of a galactic halo. Um, so I remember that, um, having that discussion with him within a year after he'd written the paper, I thought, or a, a recent paper. Um, so I think lately he's been using Gaia data to look for caustic structures in the Milky Way, too. Uh, so he's, he's still working on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, but the, the, to, to return to the point, that's the, the, uh, the actual physical distribution of axions in the galaxy it could be a lot of different things depending on the properties of the particle and how it actually condensed into the galactic halo, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so there's a lot of so. inputs to go into that. With um, so one of the things that you mentioned uh, was the leptogenesis or like the lepton flavor, what was it, lepton flavor? Le lepton flavor universality violation. Yes. Okay. Like, this is all these new results from LHCB. Qu'est-ce que uh, What is, is this? Like, way outside my specialty, but uh, uh, so it's basically looking at uh, exotic decays of B mesons mm -hmm. at LHC. Right, so you have the two big experiments. You have ATLAS and CDMS that are the big general purpose detectors. Mm -hmm. And then you have their sort of more obscure sibling, which is LHCB, which is where all the exciting physics is actually happening. Uh -huh. uh, and those guys, are, they, they just came out with a new result this week showing another anomaly in B decays. Right, so mm -hmm. there are a bunch of them now where, the, where B mesons don't decay quite the way you expect them to. Mm -hmm. And the, I think the strongest signal they've got was a, a, a few months ago, they released some, uh, some results on B goes to mu plus mu minus, if I remember rightly, that was like way off what you would expect from the standard model. Mm -hmm. Something like three and a half or four sigma, right? Wow. So I'll have to get What Sam a weird Gretzen place on, to yeah. find a signal, though. I mean, uh -huh. yeah. Uh, well, so this basically, was... the idea would be it, oh, I said, in so the this standard was... model, the. Uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Um, so there's a, there's a bit of a lag between our uh, hearing and speaking. Uh, yeah. The This was one of the things that was, uh, when the Tevatron shut down in 2010, Fermilab pivoted almost completely towards what they called the intensity frontier, which is we're going to make particle beams with lots of particles in them so that we can look for really rare events. And that's also what these LHCB, I think, is about, is instead of going for super high energy with just a few particles, we're just going to have a massive beam with lots of particles at lower energy that we can look for uh, things that happen rarely that don't necessarily need the high energy to take place. Right. And uh, so the standard model predicts that uh, all three generations of leptons should be coupled identically, right, to, uh, uh, I think, to the weak force, right? Okay. I'm trying to remember how this works. And that these, these so lepton, universa lepton flavor universality violation means that muons and electrons and tauons have different couplings in a sector where the standard model predicts that they should all be identical. So like they all couple to the Z uh, at different levels? 
Is that basically what that would say? I don't remember exactly which coupling it is. Uh, like I said, I'm not a I'm not a B physicist, but uh, but I think I think it's to the, the yeah the weak vector the weak particles mm -hmm. the W and Z bosons. Uh, I think in the standard model their coupling should be identical, and in so and they're finding evidence that they're not that the, the couplings differ. Hmm. I wonder um, if that would show up in the. I guess it's kind of hard for that to show up in say the solar neutrino data because that we don't we're using the neutrino results to constrain what's going on in the core and not vice versa um but that would be pretty yeah, to my knowledge it doesn't have much of an effect on the neutrino phys physics it's just it's things like these the, the uh, uh, quark decays into in the leptons mm -hmm. that this pops up but that would affect the early universe um when uh, yeah, presumably uh and I'm not, I'm not off the t off the top of my head sure what effect that that would have on things like uh, whether or not you could do some fun tricks with leptogenesis with that, where you could come up with lepton asymmetries or something fun. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much has been written about that. Yeah, but with leptogenesis. But back to your question, oh, right? So where where is the where is the data? Where is the interesting discrepancies? Right. The 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 big one is the Hubble parameter. That one is becoming very difficult to ignore. That the supernova measurements of the expansion rate of the universe in the cosmic microwave background are like on the order of five sigma off at this point. Uh, so here's a question about why. that: why, why is that such a concern? If those are sampling, you know, you're a, a factor of a thousand different in redshift space. Um, so how does the Hubble constant measured at a redshift of 1100 differ? Why does that necessarily have to correlate with the Hubble constant that you measured a redshift of two or one? Well, the CMB, you're really measuring the, uh, you're using the entire expansion history, right? So the, cos the cosmic microwave background measurement of the Hubble constant is sensitive to basically- Oh, all changes. Is measuring the, the luminosity distance to the surface of last scattering, right? And so that it's sensitive to uh, exp the entire expansion history. Whereas the supernovae are only sensitive to the expansion history after a redshift of you know uh, around one, right? Or a redshift of a couple of pops, right? Okay. So one or two. Um, so that there's that, and and it's not just a high redshift, low redshift distinction, right? So that if if it was just that, you would hope that, for example, you could have some sort of evolving dark energy or some sort of late time effect that would uh, uh, that would cover it. Mm -hmm. And it's now pretty well established that you can't really resolve the discrepancy very well by uh, late time expansion effects. That it just doesn't it doesn't work. You can you can reduce the the tension, but mm -hmm. you can't eliminate it. Hmm. Well, so this uh, makes me think that um, another project that I got involved in briefly at Fermi Lab was twenty one centimeter cosmology, um, right. where they're looking at intensity mapping, so looking at neutral hydrogen as a function of redshift, where the idea is that you might be able to do, get the entire history, like for the, you get the effective CMB at every redshift between us and whenever neutral hydrogen first comes into existence, um, I guess after reionization. Um, and things cool down and galaxies form and then you get neutral hydrogen, so you can go back to what, redshift six or seven. Um, and so that might be, that's still most of the history of the universe, so that might be a way of having at least another handle on what might be going on. Um, yeah. What are some thoughts that people have about the res how to resolve or what could be causing this discrepancy between cosmic microwave background measurements of the expansion of the universe and the supernova? That's what's really interesting about it to me is that there aren't any really compellingly good answers. Right. There are some things where you, if there was an anomaly, and uh, I'm trying to think of a, a, a case, but you know, things where you just go, oh, there's an obvious explanation for this. There's new physics. Maybe you have a, a an extra species of neutrino, or you can have all the usual suspects. So you could have time evolution and dark energy, extra neutrinos. Uh, you know, all of these. You know, add another particle to things or change things in these predictable ways. None of those things work for explaining this discrepancy. All the obvious things you would try fail. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's what makes it so uh, so frustrating and so interesting to me is that 
whatever it is is something really freaking weird. Mm -hmm. So the the best candidate that we have is early dark energy. So you just like sort of drop in a period of dark energy domination before the surface of before the CMB is emitted, mm -hmm. right? So the basic the the CMB measurement of the Hubble constant gets down to basically just measuring the a triangle, right? Mm -hmm. So you have uh, uh, on the CMB you have the uh, acoustic horizon size, which you can measure. That's just the characteristic size of the hot and cold spots on the CMB. That's how big the observable universe was at the time the CMB was emitted. That's about a degree. Mm -hmm. And you can calculate this if you know the contents of the universe, if you know the dark matter density and the baryon density and this kind of stuff, you can figure out how big the acoustic horizon is, right? Um, and then the other leg of the triangle is the luminosity distance to, or the angular diameter distance to the surface of last scattering, mm -hmm. right? And from that triangle, you can uh, infer the Hubble constant. Um, so the idea being that one of those legs of the triangle has to be wrong. Mm -hmm. If you're going to, if, if it's, if, if it's some systematic, if the CMB measurement is wrong and it's really, so the CMB tells you it should be around 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec mm -hmm. and the supernova tell you it's around 73. So if you want to bring the CMB up, you got to alter one of those two legs of the triangle. And the early dark energy, what it does is it changes the size of the acoustic horizon at last scattering. Mm -hmm. So it's saying that the reason you're getting it wrong is you're, mis you're misestimating how big the observable universe is at the time the CMB was formed. Okay, so and this, this constraint, um, so an early dark energy is what is the relative time scale between inflation and this, if we added this early dark energy, and what constraints are there? The only other constraint that I can think of that would exist in that window would be Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Um, That's right. So it, inflation presumably happened a long time before that. Mm -hmm. Let's take a standard, you know, a generic inflation model, you're talking energies at 10 to the 15 GeV or so, I mean, just ridiculously high energies. Uh, 100 billion times the energy of the LHC, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so what time does that correspond to um, relative to... the minus 40th seconds. Okay, so it's take. Um, uh, a factor of a thousand, or like four orders of magnitude after the Planck scale. Yeah, I, r roughly about four orders of magnitude after the Planck scale, <laughs> that's right. Um, so extraordinarily high energies. Whereas this late dark energy would happen, or what's called early dark energy. So there's the dark energy in the universe today. Early dark energy would happen sometime after nucleosynthesis, mm -hmm. right? Because if you, you know that the, the nucleosynthesis tells you that the universe was radiation dominated at the time that uh, uh, the primordial abundance of the elements was set. Mm -hmm. That's an incredibly strict constraint. If you change that even a little bit, you get the wrong abundance, primordial abundances for elements. It's an extremely sensitive measurement. So okay. you have to have be radiation dominated at nucleosynthesis. Sometime after nucleosynthesis, you have to enter a period of dark energy domination that then turns itself off again before the CMB forms, just, to, just so, so that it alters the acoustic horizon on the CMB just the right amount to, that you misestimate the Hubble constant by five kilometers per second per megaparsec. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's a lot of steps. Not but... a compelling picture, and this is the best one, right? Uh -huh. So is it really a whole lot different than, uh, okay, so it's just another scalar field that you add to the long list of scalar fields that we need to explain everything else that we see in the universe. Welcome to the party, pal. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, it's just like another one of these things. Uh, uh, so. Okay, I mean it's a it's a logical possibility, and and it's probably something that you might be able to test, mm -hmm. um, but it's not it's not one of those things where you go, oh, this is such an elegant solution. Uh, mm -hmm. I really believe it, right? But that's kind of I mean there are really very few other options that work. Mm -hmm. uh, there are lots of papers on it, but if you read the papers, mostly well, all they do is they sort of soften the, the tension. They don't really get rid of it. In any uh -huh. way that is, and some of them are written by me, right? So I we tried, for example, to look at phantom dark energy, where if you have a universe that's actually super accelerating with mm -hmm. a equation of state that's less than a cut than negative one, uh, so you're violating the null energy condition and all this terrible stuff. Would, would that and give you? a handle on it but not. if you could um do a measurement of the equation state parameter that was if you increase the precision with which you could 
measure it, would that be a way of getting a handle on it? Because uh, this reminds me a bit of the same kind of issue that happened in like the early 90s about the stellar ages in globular clusters, the tension between the ages in globular clusters and the age of the universe. Um, that dark energy well, resolved. Well, that was solved but, by dark energy, of course. Right. right. But, which apparently now, 40 years later, has um, brought forth its own, or 30 years later, has brought forth its own conundrum that um, we're getting two different results. Right. So it, it's hard to fix by late, by changing dark energy at late time. Mm -hmm. Is the bottom line on that? I mean, there have been various various people who have tried various different things, and it doesn't really work very well. We tried doing it with a lepton asymmetry, right? So if you had an excess of anti neutrinos, a big excess of anti neutrinos relative to neutrinos uh, in uh, the cosmic neutrino background, that would alter your expansion history in a particular way, mm -hmm. uh, and that once again can act to soften the discrepancy a little bit, but it can't uh, remove it completely. Hmm. So what are the, so, um, if I were to look at the set of big questions that are yet, have yet to be answered, um, especially in cosmology. So aside from, is there life in the universe? Cause um, yeah, that's a, that's a different discussion that I, even though I'm in the field of exoplanets, that's not my motivation for being in exoplanets. It's more of they needed a warm body to be useful in this thing, and so that's what I'll do. Um, but it's a hugely interesting field, though. I mean, it's like exoplanets is is the future, man. I, you guys are just good. You have like this unlimited bright future ahead of you. I, I'm jealous. Uh, it's an unlimited uh, bright future because we're still in the early stages, right? This is dark energy as it was, or dark matter as it was 15 years ago. Um, there's a lot of opportunity. Yeah, well, that's the place to, to be. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, but in like the questions in physics that are still out there, um, what would you put at the top of your list? The things that um, could might help resolve some of these cosmological questions, or that um, otherwise are still compelling questions that need to be addressed for us to have a real grasp of um, how the universe is put together. Well, I mean, there's identifying the dark matter to start with. That would be kind of nice. Mm -hmm. uh, we would. You'd really like to know what it is, and uh, I wonder what's going to happen if ten years or fifteen years or twenty years from now there's still no successful direct detection. I mean, what the what the sort of the theoretical landscape will be then if we're still in this doldrums where we can't find it. I mean, will people just will everybody just start working on Mond at that point? I don't know. But for me, I mean, as somebody who works on very early universe physics and on inflation in particular, what I'm most interested in is primordial gravitational waves. Mm -hmm. right? That's the signal that will allow you to determine all kinds of these parameters for inflation mm -hmm. in the early universe in particular. Namely, the, the number one thing is that if you can detect primordial gravity waves, that tells you the energy scale of inflation. Mm -hmm. It's high, the energy scale of inflation is highly sensitive to the gravitational wave amplitude. Um, so that, that, that's a good thing and a bad thing. So the, the, the tensor fraction, like what fraction, of the, what percentage of the CMB on isotropy is due to gravitational wave modes, depends on the energy scale of inflation to the fourth power. Mm -hmm. So that's good in that it's an incredibly it's sensitive really steep, measurement. Yeah. If you see the yeah, if you see the gravitational waves, you get a really accurate measurement of the, the inflationary energy scale. But on the other hand, that means that it's really easy to change the inflationary energy scale in such a way that the gravitational waves go from being detectable to being never detectable. Yeah, never right? detectable. Factor of 10 turns it into a factor of 10,000 in the, in the tensor fraction. Uh -huh. And there's only one universe. Are, are, they, are these, because um, this is primarily in CMB polarization results, uh, how close are you to the limit, the cosmic variance limit on that uh, angle of looking at the CMB compared to where we are currently with the just the temperature variations. Well, since the signal is the, the smaller the signal, the smaller the cosmic variance error, right? So that uh, there's no cosmic variance bound per se on how low you can go. Okay. On a so you're never going to run into um, the the cosmic background or. Well, okay. never say well, never, right? Will, we... There are other backgrounds, right? Uh -huh. Or foregrounds, right? So in, in, in cosmology, particle physicists talk about backgrounds. We talk about foregrounds and we mean mm -hmm. the same thing, right? So stuff between mm -hmm. us and the edge of the observable universe is 
a foreground, which is really what a particle physicist would call a background. Mm -hmm. right? Stuff that, get, that gets in the way of your measurement. Um, and there's a lot of, I mean, basically you're going to have other gravitational wave sources that are going to swamp that out eventually. Mm -hmm. right? And also in, in practice, what's limiting you is that it's very hard to measure CMB polarization below a certain level because the foregrounds on just the polarization are, are you're already looking at a signal to noise ratio of less than one, mm -hmm. right? So that you're having to cut out noise that's larger than the signal you're looking for. You're already at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you gotta, you gotta cut out the dust, you gotta subtract gravitational lensing, all this other stuff to get to this primordial signal. Right. But I mean, they're talking about with like CMBS4, some of these, uh, future measurements that look like, for example, in the astro decadal, they, they, uh, recommended funding this stuff, which is, I think, really good. Um, you're talking about getting down to, you know, ultimately the level of a tensor fraction of about 10 to the minus four. Right now we're at a 0.03 is the upper bound mm -hmm. from the latest bicep results that just came out this last year. Um, and I think we'll be down to 10 to the minus two fairly rapidly. 10 to the minus three is going to take a lot of work and 10 to the minus four is sort of aspirational. Mm -hmm. I think would be rough figures of merit for that. Mm -hmm. um, but 10 to the minus three is an interesting level uh, that would, uh, that's where uh, models like Starobinsky inflation live, which is one of the most compelling models that has survived the carnage of the, uh, the cosmic microwave background. Because back in the day, basically, you, you, could, you could, anything went, right? Mm -hmm. Back in the time when Rocky, when, the way Rocky puts his, you know, back in the day when you could just make shit up. Uh -huh. uh, and, and nobody could tell you you were wrong, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and in particular, I remember uh, a long time ago, there was everybody was very solemnly, you know, uh, arguing that supersymmetry told you that you should have a blue power spectrum for scalar perturbation. Mm -hmm. It's a generic prediction of supersymmetry that you had these hybrid inflation models, and, and these were really considered the leading contenders. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, once the power spectrum, so blue, me, a blue spectrum means more power on short wavelengths and less power on long wavelengths. Right. And of course, what we found is the opposite. There's more power on long wavelengths and less power on short wavelengths, which is what you would expect from like a, a symmetry breaking phase transition or this kind of thing. And then there was a big pivot to saying, well, we knew the spectrum was red all along and blue specter, just like a sunshine, <laughs> was never going to happen, right? Uh, and um, so all of those models that at one time were the darlings of the, the SUSY model building community got killed off uh, mm -hmm. really by WMAP. And, uh, um, but so the remaining models, uh, the sort of the leading contender among the remaining models, I think is probably Starobinsky inflation, which is ironically one of the, uh, Starobinsky proposed it not long after Goose came out with his original paper in the eighties. It was one of the oldest inflation models. And it's still around? Ever written down is bang on in the center of the best fit uh -huh. for Planck. Well, and if that really is the right model, We'll see the gravitational waves from it uh -huh. in the foreseeable future. Well, that's uh, that's really promising. It reminds me what you just described reminds me of when they did the gravitational radiation. Um, so they did a measurement of the arrival time of gravitational radiation from a neutron star neutron star merger and the gamma ray burst associated with the neutron star neutron star merger. That was so cool. And right. all of a sudden, half of groups doing that. I remember. Yeah. So yeah. all of a sudden, half of the um, alternative theories of gravity were just ruled out immediately um all the Bang. all the ones that predicted Science, man. yeah all the ones that predicted that the gravitational radiation would propagate at a different rate than photons like were immediately ruled out to and uh you know for i worked you know with amal upadi he'd been doing some modified gravity stuff for a long time and uh he's yeah it's like all of a sudden half of the half of the landscape is over with uh, with these yeah, singular DGP measurements is gone all those related yeah uh -huh. it, it, it was a uh, it was brilliant uh and there were a number of groups that pointed this out sort of simultaneously and not very long after those neutron star mergers mm -hmm. the data was released because it's a it's a dead simple i mean i the one that i remember being the clearest one was the one that was written by richard woodard and a couple of collaborators where it was like you would expect that if say dgp were correct if i remember the figure correctly you would expect the time to between the gravitational waves and the photons to be like 200 days uh -huh. 
and it was a fraction of a second. I mean, just like uh -huh. many, many orders of magnitude off, right? Yeah, and you know, uh, that's, so that was a beautiful thing. Yes, yeah, so that was that was really interesting. And for the torsion pendulum experiments, it also, um, you know, those anyone who does weak equivalence principle measurements is also intrinsically interested in strong equivalence principle measurements um, with now you're doing basically a torsion pendulum experiment using neutron stars and black holes that does bode well I think so maybe gravitational radiation astronomy might be a way to get another handle because this will also if not with the ground-based observatories maybe Lisa will be able to do standard siren measurements and get another measurement of the Hubble constant that's independent of the others um, so maybe that's something they're to already look doing to. that with LIGO Virgo. I okay, mean, the, the, the error is a big still, right? So that it, basically LIGO Virgo gives so you a, you're both a, right. a number that's in between the two, but with a big error bar, and you really uh -huh. can't distinguish yet. Uh -huh. But I think that they're they're thinking that if they have enough statistics, it will actually be a, a reasonable check and balance on that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it'd be kind of neat if the if standard sirens can become at least even vaguely competitive, and and you know. If they land on one or the other, that might give you a hint as to which one is uh, giving you the wrong answer, right? Uh -huh. Or how the wrong answer comes to be, or how the discrepancy originates. So yeah. I guess as a, it's as hard to imagine it's a systematic in Planck, and it's hard to imagine it's a systematic in the supernovae. I mean, you look at how careful they've been with, and, and, every, and every time they come out with a new analysis of the supernova data where they understand their systematics better. Uh -huh. Their error bar gets smaller, and the the, the, point the central the result doesn't, doesn't change. Right? Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, so it's becoming more it's becoming harder to argue that it's a systematic in the supernova data, which I think would probably been my initial guess. Uh -huh. Well, there's a, it's pretty messy physics to understand what's really happening with the supernova. Right. Certainly, twenty years ago when it was, or twenty two years ago when it was first discovered, there was a lot of uncertainty in the how um, right. how to translate all that. Um, so as one a one weirdness in the Planck, oh go ahead. One weirdness in the Planck data is that the discrepancy is dominated entirely by the high multipole measurements, right? So if you take the high L measurements and cut them out mm -hmm. and sort of artificially reduce the Planck data to about the same uh, resolution, angular resolution as the W map data, mm -hmm. then the Hubble constant goes up. So the large angle data in, in the CMB actually tends to agree with the supernovae, but it's when you only when you take the small angle data and put it all together that uh, it, the discrepancy becomes large. Is there a way to uh, do that with curvature? I think that some people have argued this. I think Alessandro Melchiori and some of their collaborators have argued that this is there's evidence for positive curvature and that this could contribute to resolving the Hubble parameter discrepancy. Mm -hmm. Uh, but once again, I don't think I think that reduces the tension, but I don't think it eliminates it entirely. If I mm -hmm. remember correctly. Okay, it's that's outside of my wheelhouse, but um, I could imagine you know if you're saying on small scales things are like it's not self similar all the way down to the smallest scales, then that might. Um, and you're sensitive to some kind of curvature like there. Yeah, I, I suppose it's a possibility. I, I don't think anybody's really ever figured out why that's true. And it could be that it's just a fluke of cosmic variance, mm -hmm. right? Because at large angles, your cosmic variance uncertainty is large. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, right, so is it just that we happen to live in a universe that's a little tilted just by chance, mm -hmm. right? Um, maybe. All right, so as a last uh, topic, why don't you tell us about this book that uh, that your name is attached to and when, where it is, what it talks right. about, and where we can see it, and when to expect it. So let me bring up the cover here uh, so I can show it to the camera. Uh, so this is um, called An Infinity of Worlds. Uh, cosmic inflation and the beginning of the universe, uh, and it is uh, set for release by MIT Press. Uh, the book is going to be released on March eight. Uh, so here is the cover of the book. I don't even have a physical copy of it yet. They're not coming until the end of the month. Oh, hold on. Uh, pull that one up again because I didn't have it actually in the frame. Let me let me slide you over. There we go. An infinity of worlds. 
Okay, and what does it have in it? It is a book about cosmic inflation. Uh, so the, 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 the conceit of the book is that there really aren't any good popular level treatments of uh, inflation from a, from a modern perspective that are out there, right? And so that we, that we recognize the need for uh, this kind of a book. Mm -hmm. so, the, the, so what are the ones that a, come close to it in terms like, of what, what are the nearest neighbors well, to this one? Alan Guth wrote in the 90s. Uh, about inflation. So mm -hmm. that was the last time there was really a popular level book that was entirely devoted to the subject of cosmological and the cosmic inflation in particular. Mm -hmm. Alex Vilenkin has written a few popular level books talking about like the inflationary multiverse and the string landscape and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, but uh, as, for, as for books that really just start to finish explain how inflation works at a, uh, at a, non, at a pedagogical, non-mathematical level mm -hmm. and why we believe the evidence favors it, right? Uh, there, there's really nothing out there at the moment at, uh, at a level that would be for the general public. Okay. So that's the primary purpose of the book. So the, the book is an explainer on inflation. Uh, just saying, what is it? How does it work? How does it change our basic picture of the structure of the universe? Um, what's the evidence in favor of it? I mean, because one of the big things with inflation is that there is a lot of reason from the data to believe that it's the correct theory of the early universe. Right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of tests that you can do with specific predictions in particular that the single field inflation models make that have been extensively tested and, and inflation has really passed those tests with flying colors. So there's a, there is now, you know, some reason to believe that we're getting at something correct about the physics of the extremely early universe. And then uh, the book talks about, so, so if we take inflation to be the right theory, right? Mm -hmm. And say, what are its, now what does this tell us about how the universe ought to work? You end up in this picture of uh, eternal self-reproduction, the idea that inflation keeps going forever and it only ends in localized pockets of the universe. Um, this is the idea of eternal inflation. So you end up pretty much automatically generating this gigantic multiverse. Mm -hmm. as, soon as, you, uh, as soon as you write down a typical inflation model, the multiverse has come out of it for free and they're very difficult. To so th that sounds kind of like the way Max Tegmark described it in his mathematical universe, that it's you have this right. big thing and then little so, pockets of universes appear with different properties. Right, and I think in Tegmark's <laughs> classification, that's like a type two multiverse or something like that yeah, exactly. he goes the, the type one is just like in any you know sort of standard flat cosmology you have regions outside your horizon and mm -hmm. in a sense are those in a sense are other universes right and i think that's what he calls a type one and then the inflationary multiverse is a type two where you actually have little bubbles and each bubble itself contains an infinite universe mm -hmm. and they're separated by regions of accelerating expansion so they can in principle they never run into each other mm -hmm. right so you have this big basically inflation once you start it runs away from you and you can't stop it anymore except in localized regions where you make these bubble universes that are completely causally separated from each other mm -hmm. so in, in this sense it's not even really science right you can't ever test this mm -hmm. because you're causally disconnected from these other separate universes. Mm -hmm. so from the comparison group? You can only yeah, study the control they're, they're, group. So, you, so this brings up this problem of how do you cope, you know, sort of in, in a philosophy of science sense with uh, this theory that you can test within your own bubble universe and seems to match the data pretty well what makes these, this prediction that is inherently untestable, right? So that you, you have something that lies right on the boundary of what you would actually call a scientific theory at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so how, how do you make sense of this and do you believe it and don't you believe it? And, and, and so I, I spend a lot of time in the book talking about that problem and how, and, and sort of what it means for a cosmologist and how I try to get my own head around it and how I, uh, I come to accept it. For, for a long time, I was, very, I was very dubious about the whole multiverse idea and I spent a lot of time trying to kill it. And in the process of trying to kill it, I realized how robust it really is. Mm -hmm. So I, this is one of the things that over the course of many years, I've definitely changed my mind about. Hmm. Is, um, is that as you, try to, as you try to come up with ways to avoid this, what appears to be a ridiculous consequence, you find that there's almost, there are very few ways to weasel out of it uh, that make a whole lot of sense. Why, why were we motivated to devise 
inflation to begin with? What was it that motivated Guth and the early practitioners to even come up with this idea? Well, Guth was motivated by a problem in grand unified theories. Uh, so in the, at the time he was working, people were talking about these theories of unification, right? Where you would be, uh, uh, the strong and the electro weak forces would be unified at somewhere around 10 to 14, 10 to 15 GeV or so. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the predictions of these theories was that they would produce this enormous abundance of magnetic monopoles. Right, one-dimensional topological defects mm -hmm. that come about from the breaking of this grand unified symmetry in these very simple gut models like SU5s mm -hmm. uh, and whatnot, right, that, uh, that also predicted proton decay that turned out not to be there. So these models got ruled out ultimately by proton decay experiments. Mm -hmm. Good thing that they were but repurposed they predicted... to make uh, neutrino oscillation measurements. Yes, I know. That was so lucky that they turned out to be good neutrino detectors because, uh, uh, yeah, they, what are you going to do with uh, 10 million gallons of water? Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> Besides, you can you can break a whole bunch of photomultiplier tubes. But... Um, so that that was a really nice save on the part of the uh, neutrino community there. But because uh, those, yeah, as you know, those were originally built as uh, proton decay yeah. detection experiments. But uh, uh, Goose was, uh, as I understand the history of it, his his real the problem that he was really worried about was. Uh, diluting, getting rid of these magnetic monopoles from the gut phase transition. Mm -hmm. And inflation does that very nicely. If you have accelerated expansion, it dilutes those monopoles. To the point where you and won't see them anymore. So he writes this down and then, reali then realizes you could explain the flatness of the universe. You could solve the flatness problem with, uh, in particular. Uh, and that was, you know, there's a very famous page from his notes that is on display at the Adler Planetarium, where it's a spectacular realization. This could solve the flatness problem that Dickey pointed out in a uh, certain set of lect lectures, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so his and, motivation uh, was actually, he backed into the observational side of what inflation would do for cosmology right. and was approaching it purely from the, or primarily at least from the particle physics side. Uh, yeah, okay, so I it's a different set of observations. Let me rephrase that. It's a different set of observations. In, instead of looking, right, um, it would be a set of observations that was more geared towards the the particle physics consequences of the theory rather than right. the the large scale astronomical observations of the theory. <clears throat> right, but it was quickly realized after that. Um, by Hawking and uh, Linde, and I'm trying to remember the other people involved that inflation would, that quantum processes in inflation would generate the seed perturbations or structure formation in the universe. Mm -hmm. and you, could, you could basically, because the, the inflationary universe has a horizon, that's sort of the inverse of a black hole horizon, right? A black hole horizon is a trap surface where all physical paths lead to the interior. Uh, an inflationary horizon is an anti-trap surface where all physical paths lead to the exterior of it. Mm -hmm. um, it. But inflationary horizons like black hole horizons have Hawking radiation. And this Hawking radiation at the inflationary horizon uh, you can, it gives you a, a calculable handle on basically the, the, this Hawking radiation forms the seeds for the density perturbations that collapse to form structure in the universe, galaxies, and clusters. And you can actually, if I write down a, a particular potential for inflation, you can turn the crank and you can calculate exactly how these quantum fluctuations would look and you can test them in the CMB. This is how you make contact with data. Mm -hmm. um, it's a straightforward uh, quantum field theory and curve space-time calculation uh, that you can do that, that tells you, that makes very definite predictions about what you should see in the CMB. And in fact, we see those predictions are borne out by what we actually see in the CMB to very high precision now. Um, are there... This was 10 years before COBE. I, I don't know if anybody at the time really even thought that this kind of stuff would be measurable. Uh, Certainly not in, so... you know, at the time, the <clears throat> looking for Supersymmetry in what LEP, I guess, was the the new thing on the particle physics side. <laughs> Has there been, um, are there any continuing issues with inflation? Um, so, for example, in Roger Penrose's gigantic book, uh, that's like nine thousand pages long, um, The Road to Reality. I don't know if you. Uh huh. <clears throat> so he, I have not read that, but it was a. Uh, <laughs> it was interesting. It was a bit of a slog, um, but I learned a lot. One of the things he points out is 
that while inflation solves a number of problems relating to um, like the flatness problem and the, um, the where are the, or the the flatness problem, the horizon problem, that the temperature is the same everywhere. Right. Uh, but then he says what you don't address or what it doesn't address is the entropy issue where you have to start, if entropy is always increasing, then the universe had to start from an incredibly tiny um, set of possible entropy spaces uh, because you have to run That's this right. clock backwards. Um, and that does imply... Well, oh, go ahead. <clears throat> To a certain degree, entropy provides, a, I mean, uh, inflation provides a partial solution to that, in my opinion, in that once you get inflation going, right, mm -hmm. well, we'll, we'll worry about initial conditions in a minute, but once inflation starts, it very rapidly drives the entropy in that inflationary bubble to zero, right? Okay. So at least if you say i believe it does it by got started somehow let me see if i understand it does it by saying you had some entropy and then you spread it out and so now there's none right <clears throat> right so inflation basically drives the density of uh everything in the universe to zero that's how it gets rid of the monopoles mm -hmm. um and the only thing that is left is a coherent scalar field condensate so basically the universe the inflationary universe before the onset of the big bang Right before the hot Big Bang, the thermal equilibrium, hot thermal equilibrium state of the early universe, the universe is a zero temperature Bose-Einstein condensate filled with just a, scalar, a, a coherent scalar field. Mm -hmm. Right, and that has unbelievably <coughs> low entropy. And okay. then you produce a little bit of entropy at the end of inflation and reheating when you heat the universe back up and you start the regular uh, hot Big Bang phase of the universe. But before the Big Bang and inflation the universe is in a effectively zero entropy state what inside is, the inflationary bubble. What is reheating? Reheating is basically you know that the, the early universe was hot, dense, dominated by radiation. This is the hot Big Bang, mm -hmm. right? We know that's true at least at nucleosynthesis and probably much earlier than that. Um, so inflation gives you a universe that doesn't itself gives you a universe that looks totally different from that. The universe in inflation is cold, there's nothing in, cold and empty. Uh -huh. um, so how do you get from that cold, empty universe to the hot universe uh, that we know was there in the early phases of the universe we live in? Mm -hmm. That process is reheating. So basically, you have a scalar field that gives you energy density in the universe. And that energy density in the scalar field, inflation ends at a certain time. That energy density that's stored in the vacuum then gets converted into particles by coupling between the inflaton field and the standard model. So the inflaton decays into all of the particles in the standard model, heats the universe up at the end of this inflationary phase, and that period is called reheating. Okay. Uh, why? Okay. Um, uh, you'll have to just help me out here. Um, what is it that? So when the universe is going through inflation, there's basically an ambient energy density, almost like a dark energy density that's gigantic, and then it's like a cosmological <clears throat> constant. That's okay, right. and then it that energy it's pent up in the field and gets somehow coupled to the standard model particles and is able to convert into kinetic, you know, random kinetic energy that gives you the temperature. Is that that's exactly right, uh, and that typically happens very rapidly. Right, it's a super efficient process. Mm -hmm. Um, because there's, it's actually, a, there's parametric resonances and stuff, this phenomenon called preheating, where you actually have nonlinear effects that can make this happen extremely quickly at the end of inflation. You just go boom and you produce all this explosive particle production. Thermal equilibrium happens very rapidly. And then from then on, it's a standard hot Big Bang cosmology. Hmm. Okay. So in inflation, you're really replacing the Big Bang with the initial singularity in a, in a standard Big Bang cosmology, you're replacing that with the end of inflation. Mm -hmm. And inflation happens before that. Okay. The problem is that, and I think this speaks a little bit more toward the point that Penrose was making, which was a deeper one, which is that um, inflation doesn't really get rid of that initial singularity. It just pushes it arbitrarily far back in time and you still have the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just displaced. It could be by immense amounts of time because inflation can go on. There's no upper bound on how much inflation you can have, especially mm -hmm. in an internally inflating universe. It can, it, the universe could have been inflating for a quintillion years before our bubble condensed out of it. Uh -huh. We have no way of knowing. Um, but still somewhere back there in that murky past, you can show this is a theorem called Morde-Guthen-Vilenkin. So in 2003, 
uh, Borde, Guth, and Vilenkin showed that inflation is what's called geodesically incomplete. Mm -hmm. That in fact, there are observers that see uh, a, 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 essentially still the, the singularity is still back there at finite time in the past, mm -hmm. inevitably in inflation models. So you don't actually explain, the inflation doesn't explain its own initial conditions, it just pushes them so far back that there's no way to actually get any observational handle on them, which is sort of the second problem, right? So eternal inflation creates two problems. One is this multiverse, mm -hmm. which is distasteful, I think, to most physicists. Mm -hmm. And the second one is <clears throat> that it doesn't actually get rid of the need to understand the initial conditions for the universe. Well, it removes it one from the realm of science. Have it going, that's right. Um, and one of the things that uh, I talk about in the book is that this is very similar to the uh, sort of the philosophical conundrums that were uh, written about by Giordano Bruno in the late 1500s mm -hmm. that ultimately got him burned at the stake by yeah. the Roman Catholic Inquisition in 1600. So I, I read a lot of Bruno while I was writing the book. Uh -huh. Um, and Bruno was really grappling with exactly the same problems in the late 1500s. And in particular, in, in the language of the, the Renaissance astronomers, there were the two problems. One in, was that if you accepted Copernicanism, right, Copernicus's idea, Bruno was even more Copernican than Copernicus in the sense that he realized that not only can, is the Earth not in a special place, but this, the only possible conclusion you could draw is that there's an infinity of worlds. And the, the title of the book comes from a quote from uh, uh, one of Bruno's books. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Bruno said, uh, uh, thus is the glory of God made manifest, not in a thousand suns, not in a million, but uh, I say in an infinity of worlds, mm -hmm. um, is, a, uh, is the quote from Bruno. So I believe that I have so that same quote this... in the first chapter of the book that I'm working on, so. <laughs> Excellent. Well. <laughs> I beat you to it, man. <laughs> uh -huh. I have to change that. Um, oh, so you're a Bruno fan. This is good. And the, so the second problem was he was grappling with the idea of Aristotle's concept of a prime mover. Mm -hmm. that in Aristotelian physics, any motion had to have a cause, right? This was, uh, this was pre-relativistic, pre-Newtonian, mm -hmm. and in Aristotle's idea that every, every motion had to be caused by something. And the, the cause of that motion had to be some other kind that, that itself had a cause. And eventually, if you follow the chain and effect back, there had to be some first cause to the universe. And uh, Thomas Aquinas identified that with God, right? You know, so uh, uh, Aristotle, of course, was not a Christian, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it was it was this idea of the uh, the the prime the first force, the prime mover was adopted in Christian theology in, in, in the Middle Ages mm -hmm. uh, quite enthusiastically. And that was one of the reasons why they burned Bruno at the stake, right? That his uh, two of the eight charges against him in the, uh, uh, that he was imprisoned and refused to recant were uh, the uh, uh, heliocentric cosmology and the doctrine of an infinity of worlds. <laughs> um, and Bruno interestingly connected these two things. So he viewed this infinity of worlds as a way to philosophically resolve the conundrum of the first mover, Aristotle's first mover, in a way that uh, that preserved the, the greatness of God. <coughs> and so, basically, I sort of, I, I try to make an analogy in my book between Bruno's resolution of these two things, his connection of those two things. Um, with the inf the problem of the inflationary multiverse and the problem of the inflationary boundary con initial condition, mm -hmm. both of them are inherently untestable. So that the only way you're going to resolve them is not by any kind of observation. You're it's going to have to be by the application of some kind of principle. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I, I, basically, the problem we have, and I don't present any real resolution to it, but just pointing out that the problem we have is extremely similar to the problem that Bruno was trying to grapple with, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, understanding both Copernicanism and Aristotle's prime mover in his theological system. Basically, we have the same problem in inflationary cosmology with the multiverse and the, and the problem of boundary conditions, as uh, shown up by. 
teleporting into the blank theory. Mm -hmm. Which is the bounty of exoplanets, because there are an infinity of worlds that we get to study. Um, That's right. Well, Bruno was hundreds of years ahead of his time, right? Uh -huh. And now not only are we, you know, are we are one planet of many planets, uh, but we are in one galaxy of many galaxies and one universe that may be well, well be one of many universes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's a there's a big tension in the field right now between devotees of the anthropic principle, which say that our universe is in some way special, mm -hmm. or a Copernican viewpoint, which is that our universe must not be special, that we must be in some way ordinary. And these two things are at odds with each other. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, there's there's still people. Uh, this is a subject of actual debate in the cosmological community as to whether or not anthropic reasoning makes any sense, whether you can make predictions about our universe strictly by anthropic means alone, mm -hmm. which, for example, was advocated by Steven Weinberg. Um, and I'm highly critical of that thesis in my book. And uh, so my book really argues for a more Copernican viewpoint mm -hmm. uh, of the universe rather than an anthropic one. Well, and there's only uh, two months left to go before it hits the shelves. So, uh, yeah, I know. I, I, I'm learning a, 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 probably the person who is a, a, a having the hardest time with that is me. Uh, uh -huh. You know, uh, I'm, uh, I'm on pins and needles waiting for the book to come out, but mm -hmm. uh, seeing how it's going to be received, of course. But um, so anyway, that's a, that's a short summary of what the book is about and the kind of things it talks about. Very cool. Uh, Do you have a moment to answer a couple questions that people have written in or? Uh, sure. Awesome. All right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, one of them, is is there a way of knowing how continuous the expansion of the universe was? For example, if it had short moments of acceleration and then slowing down um, in the history. Um, no, that's hard to measure, right? Because typically most measurements of the expansion rate, you just measure the amount of expansion up to a certain redshift and then make sort of assumptions about its time evolution. Um, so that measuring the Hubble, the expansion rate as a function of time, even at, certainly on astrophysical scales, people are getting to a point where we're starting to be able to do that, measuring the Hubble, the expansion rate as a function of redshift, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, that's hard to do astrophysically, but then once you get get earlier than the cosmic microwave background, it's it's very uh, it's very difficult. There's certainly certainly earlier than nucleosynthesis, there's a lot of freedom to have different periods of different kinds of expansion after after the end of inflation, but before primordial nucleosynthesis, when you know that the universe was radiation dominated and was mm. expanding. You have like twenty orders of magnitude in time to. Um, that that's would, right. It would it basically there's a lot of uncertainty there. Uh, you would need some kind of phase transition that the universe goes through to that it can leave a fingerprint on right um would right. would like a, uh and so there's a lot of freedom to play games mm -hmm. what kinds of is, is this where you would get like maybe a phase transition at the where the strong force decouples from um the weak force or something like that yeah i know that like it's it's an interesting fact that what is it the the mass inside the observable universe at the time of the quark hadron phase transition, if I remember rightly, is about something like an Earth mass, uh, which is a weird coincidence, well. if I'm remembering this correctly. Uh, and so that you could, I think there are some places where you, some windows where you could create primordial black holes in those kind of phase transitions in the very early universe if you had something funny happen, mm -hmm. that you could see relic black holes from it, for example. Okay. The next question here is, uh, is it possible to consider the expansion of the early universe as adiabatic? I, I think I can probably answer this to begin with, but I'll, I'll go ahead and finish the question. The expansion of the universe is adiabatic and figure out the parameters from that. I think that's the real premise of most cosmology is the assumption of adiabatic expansion early, right? Your audio is breaking up again. Okay. Could you repeat the question a yeah. little more slowly? Okay, so this is, um, is it possible to consider the expansion of the early universe as adiabatic and figure out the parameters from that model? Now I can't hear you at all. Can you hear me? I can hear you. So, I can't hear you. Okay. Um, oh, no, no, I can. Okay. I'll try again. All right. Uh, last time. If it doesn't work, then uh, we'll declare victory. Um, the question is, is it possible to consider the expansion of the early universe as adiabatic and then figure out some of the parameters, like cosmological parameters from that? Um, 
the answer to that is yes, it almost certainly was very close to adiabatic, right? So conservation of entropy in adiabatic expansion is one of the basic conservation rules that you use to uh, uh, understand um, uh, expansion in the early universe in the hot thermal equilibrium state. Mm -hmm. Unless there are particle decays or something like that, the expansion, if you're in thermal equilibrium, the expansion is adiabatic and entropy is a conserved quantity okay. uh, for a lot of uh, cosmological expansion. Okay. Um, I think that wraps up the questions that we have from here. Um, okay. And I really appreciate your time. Thank you for tuning in. Hey, it was this good has to been talk super to you. fun. Yeah. Anyways, I really appreciate your time. I uh, wish you the best, especially with the upcoming semester. Our classes Thank start. Um, our classes start in less than a week, so it should be fun to have all the students back in the classroom. And uh, I will. I guess we'll be in touch. Um, thanks again.